Today on This Week in Startups, 21-year-old Seth Prebatch, the founder of Scavenger, joins us. The tough questions keep rolling in on another segment of Ask Jason. And the remarkable, talented, and well-poised Kathy Choi delivers the news, all that and more, right now on This Week in Startups. That's what it's all about, man. Hey, Sid. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Uh, hello, hello, everybody. It's Thanksgiving week. It's the week. Of my birthday. Happy birthday. Well, that'll be Sunday. Guess how old I am. The big 4-0? It is the big 4-0. Wow. It's hard to imagine. I was just listening to my old podcast, the Silicon Alley Reporter that I did on Pseudo. Josh Harris emailed me a link with one of the early episodes with Fred Wilson mm -hmm. uh, and Brad Eld from 1997. Wow. And I was listening to myself and I was just thinking, wow, it's 13 years later and I'm doing the same <laughs> thing. Uh, and, and loving every minute of it. Uh, what a great show we have for you today. That one key difference. One key difference? You're, you. Well, no, you're officially old now. I am officially old. I mean, <laughs> actually, you know, when I was growing up in my 20s, I actually thought people who were 40 years old were old. Yeah. And I guess that is true. You are old. And I'm sort of, um, you know, I thought in my... Is 40 the new officially old? No, I think 40s are the new uh, 30s, honestly. And, and the 50s are the new 20s. I mean... <laughs> Uh, I keep telling myself, you know, anyway, I, you know, I, I always thought like, hey, when you reach 40, it's like, oh my God, you're going to be like, oh my God, my life's over, oh my God, it's over, I can't compete, or whatever. I, I, I feel like I'm in the prime of my life. I've never been happier. Everything's going really well. I feel like I'm in the zone. My writing has come back, like, incredibly. I mean, I'm writing like two, three pieces a week. I'm only publishing one or two, but I feel like my writing's coming back. I just feel like I'm in the zone. Mahalo is crushing it, as you know. We're working on Mahalo together. We're working on This Weekend is crushing it. Um... I think that this whole thing, like, you, you get as old as you want to be. I feel like I'm 25. When I see people, who, when, I, when I hang out with the Open Angel Forum companies and they're 25-year-olds, where all the people who work here, like, probably, what's the average age at Mahalo, you think, the median? 26, seven? Yes. I might hang out with Jacob and Jeff and these guys. I hang out with a bunch of 20-somethings. You stay young. I think that's mm -hmm. the secret. We stay with a bunch of people. Uh, anyway, uh, happy birthday to me. Uh, <laughs> and... Um, you are going to tell us the name of your company on the 100th episode, which comes in five episodes, which is sometime in December. Maybe. Maybe. It may not be ready because yeah. it's taking time. I, I'll have something to announce on that show. Well, I don't want you just announcing, like... <laughs> yeah, no, it's worth it. It'll be worth announcing. Okay. okay. Fine. Um, so, uh, hey, the launch conference is taking off. Everybody's talking about it. We sold a bunch of tickets already. Thank God, because I'm about 400,000 dimes into this thing. That's basically what it costs to do. I mean, yeah. you're basically in for 40 high societies. I mean, I could basically play the World Series of Poker for the rest of my life for the right. cost to do in one conference. But I think I'm, we're going to break even and maybe turn a small profit that we can invest in the companies. We need companies. But that's part of the, one of the brilliant parts of this particular conference. I've never heard this done before where yeah. the profits go into the companies. Yes. And people say, oh my God, this is uh, an incredibly, um, you know, altruistic thing for you to do, Jason. You're giving the money for the profits from the conference, which, you know, TechCrunch 50 made millions of dollars in profits for both Mike and I, um, so it did very well uh, for a number of years. And this conference I don't think will make as much because I want to lower the ticket price. I want everybody to be able to afford to go. That's why I made it a $400 ticket price. And people who use the code Jason Nation this week get 10% off, so they're down to, what is that, 360? Yeah. It's basically, it's not much profit there in those tickets. We'll make the profit in other places like sponsorships and the $1,000 tickets for VCs and whatnot. But anyway, point is, I'm trying to change the whole conference business. I'm into, you know, like I want to disrupt it in a way. <laughs> to use a word. Yeah. I'd like to disrupt the conference business. Yeah. So how would you disrupt other conferences? Uh -huh. The way I would do it is take their $3,000 or $6,000 ticket price and run it down to 400 Another way I would disrupt it is, instead of charging people to be on stage, I would let them go based on merit. But the evolution beyond that, my 3.0 of the launch style conference, is that any profits from the conference, the companies that present will have the opportunity to have that money invested in them. Uh, plus, we're going to have an angel grand jury. So if you ever go to the Sundance Film Festival mm -hmm. or Toronto, there's a grand jury. The grand jury is made up of people who are angel investors, et cetera. And what do they do? 
They watch all the films. They mentor the filmmakers. They talk to them about what to do at the event. And then they decide um, uh, who the best war companies were. So in addition to the judges on stage, we'll still have that. There's going to be a grand jury of angels, 12 angels. And they will mentor all the companies. At the end of the day, they're going to get together for a round table, sort of like this, and talk about which ones they most want to invest in. And I'm going to ask them all to commit at least $100,000 to one of the companies. So at the end of the day, they might actually say, hey, I want to invest in Mint, or I want to invest in Yammer. Mm -hmm. So if I can come to terms with them, I'm going to. Or they might talk to Mint before the event, during the event, and say, I think I want to invest. So would you know, a $5 million pre-money be acceptable for me to put 100 in? And they might say yes. And then on stage, they actually announce, hey, I put 100000 into it. Um, and for those angels, they're going to get first look at these companies. So it's really good for them. And they're going to get the massive press. So I'm, I haven't selected the 12 angels, but you're going to help me do that with the Open Angel Forum stuff. So yeah, it's a big innovative thing. But in terms of for me, I'm just trading short-term greed for long-term greed. Don't give me too much credit. <laughs> I'm looking back at the track record of TechCrunch 50 and saying, right. Mint, yep. Power Set, mm -hmm. Yammer, mm -hmm. Fitbit. Mm -hmm. I mean, just go down the line. Red Beacon, I would want to invest in all those companies. I would much rather have taken the money I made from the last three years and have invested in those companies and actually have had the cash. So I'm just basically going long. I'm yeah. just in investing for the long term. So launch will be the newsletter, which launches in December, the event, and then also sort of like a mini fund. Um, and you know, you'll get your beak wet. So <laughs> the empty chair, yeah. I'm gonna, poor Lon. Um, anyway, um, if you want to uh, get a free ticket, I'm trying to get people who can't afford, even at that low price of 360, 400, into the event. If you want a free ticket to the launch conference, you can do so by checking into 10 This Week in Startups Live by tweeting, I want to go to the launch.is slash conference. Uh, and you check it in the chat room with uh, whoever's hosting in the chat room and say you want to go to it. If you come 10 times, you get a free ticket. That's up to 50 people or 100 people, whatever we're doing. I think only it's like two dozen people have done it. Um, and. Uh, poof. So everything's going great. Uh, we're going to have a show on Friday that I'm pre-taping. It's going to be an all-ass Jason on Friday. Look for that. We're going to actually play it on Friday at 1 o'clock when you're home on Turkey Day, which you know, this is, my, this is my favorite holiday. And uh, one of my favorite companies is SendGrid. SendGrid is the industry leader in the delivery of transactional email. Tyler, tell everybody, what is transactional email? So if you're starting a, a website and you have registrations and you have notifications and password changes and there's literally half a dozen types of, uh, of these types of emails that you're going to use in various different ways like to keep people coming back, right? It's actually part of the main success of Facebook. Actually, as far as I'm concerned is... You've got a message. Somebody yes. commented on your photo. Yes. These little things that draw you back in. Yep. Those are the transactional ones, and that's what SendGrid does perfectly. Yeah, you, they're, they're mission critical to your Account business. Account registration account. confirmations, you don't want those to get lost in the spam yeah, uh, filter. Yeah. Password reset notifications, right. critical. I can't tell you how many times I've had a password reset notification go to a spam box, and I go look for it, and I find it amongst my spam. Uh, purchase receipts, sh uh, shipping notifications, and of course, friend follow requests, like you're saying. Guess, guess the clients here. I mean, this is amazing. Foursquare, you might have heard of them, clients of SendGrid. Formspring, you might have heard of them, just raised a huge round. Hootsuite, I use that. SlideShare, I mean, these are the these are Class A and companies using SendGrid. Those guys are doing some big volume too. So, uh, and like you mentioned, these are the viral people, Foursquare yep. and Formspring. Yep. I mean, those are them as viral as it gets. Yep. They are now hiring. If you are a web application engineer, there is no better company. Maybe Mahala, but anyway, no better company than SendGrid for you to go work at uh, backend engineer, sales and marketing. You just go ahead and uh, they got to be growing fast. They're crushing it, and we, you use them as well. Yep. Um, and we're going to start using them here at Mahalo. My guys are all integrating them. All that said, it's actually dead simple to get set up, as powerful as it is. Yeah. But it's surprisingly simple to get up and running. Hey, I'm going to have this up in Mahalo uh, in December because, frankly, I got, some, I got some problems at Mahalo with things getting lost in the mail. Because we, be, we rolled our own. Mm -hmm. And you know what? We're busy with a lot of different mm -hmm. features. It's a specialty, like... you got to get the IP addresses right. you got to yeah. know how these spam assassin things yep. work. There's so yeah. many layers to it. Uh, and thank you to SendGrid for sponsoring independent media. If you appreciate SendGrid sponsoring this show, uh, then just say, hey, thank you, at SendGrid. Thank you, at SendGrid. Uh, I'm really... Um, Too bad they don't have an animal uh, mascot. They should. Sound Send that you could mimic. I could do the, <laughs> the, the SendGrid lion. Rawr. <laughs> the swoosh. Maybe you're like the envelope swoosh sound on the iPhone or something. No, you guys have to have like... A, it, it could be like a crow, the sangry crow. <laughs> caw, caw, caw. <laughs> anyway, I'm really excited to have um, uh, our next guest on. Seth uh, Prebatch is the chief ninja at Scavenger, 
without the vowels, uh, S C V N G R. It's uh, an iPad, app, it's an iPhone app, uh, sort of like a, you know, I guess the way he describes it is the game layer on top of the real world. It's a, it's another one of these con things. Remember, we had Khan Academy on the last yes. episode, which was great, and people just love that episode. Scavenger is the same kind of thing. I, you know, I, I heard about it. I heard about yep. it. I heard about. You know, by the time like the sixth or seventh person tells me about something, yep. I'm like, all right, shut up already. Yes. I'll have the kid on the program. <laughs> right. We'll find out directly from him what he's doing, and then I check it out when I'm in Boston. Yeah. And so I, we had the open angel form in Boston. Yep. I go. And five people come up to me, literally five people. Have you seen Scavenger? I'm like, yes. The three other people who work for the company, this is like kid knows marketing. Yeah. I keep calling him a kid because I think he's like in his early 20s, his yeah. first company. And then I open up the New York Times the week after I'm in Boston, and there's a picture of this kid's mug on the, in the New York Times saying, crazy enough, founders need to be insane, and da da da. And I'm like, hey, well, that's sort of my branding, insane yeah. founder. Yeah. Uh, Seth, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me here. Uh, so you are uh, a kid. You're 21, 22 years old, I understand? I, I'm 21, but this is actually my third startup. So I've, right. got, I've got some level of experience. Maybe. Some level of experience. Um, tell us, I mean, you're based in Boston, is that correct? Correct. Um, so tell us, uh, when did you come up with the idea for Scavenger, and what is the idea? Sure. So Scavenger is a company that I founded uh, about two years ago uh, when I was a freshman at Princeton. Um, pitched it to the Princeton Business Plan competition uh, and then uh, ended up winning that and dropping out of school because uh, that's what all the cool kids were doing and I figured I should follow suit. Um, and, and the idea behind Scavenger is, is simple but, but far-reaching. Um, you know, as you said, what we're trying to do is build a game layer on top of the world. Uh, and that's sort of a new thing. But, but what we mean by that is it's one massive global game. Uh, it's a location-based game. It's a mobile game. It's a social game that you play from your iPhone or Android. But it's also a fully functional game engine that enables everyone who plays the game, and also now over a thousand enterprises or a local business or a museum, a city, a restaurant, a brand, you name it, to also build out part of this game. So it's one massive game and one massive game engine. Uh, so uh, I heard game engine, I heard game mechanics layered on top of the real world. Uh, how does that exactly manifest itself? Am I playing We Rule and am I, am I farming? Uh, you know, Central Park, you're putting augmented reality on top of Central Park. Take me through a real world example of how you've gamed the real world. Sure. So, so uh, you, you'll be happy to know there is no farming in Scavenger, uh, though, though we hear that that's very profitable. Um, but the, the way that Scavenger works is simple. Uh, you go places, any place you can imagine. Uh, we just announced a massive partnership with, uh, with, with Google and have access to their, uh, to their global places database through their places API developer preview. So any place you can imagine, coffee shop in Tokyo, museum in Paris, a park here in Boston, wherever you are, and you do things there. Um, we call these things that you do challenges. And so you might go to a place and you can check in on Scavenger just like you can check in on many, many services. But the core unit of what you do is this thing called a challenge which anyone can build. So at any place you could check in, you could snap a picture, you could do the social check-in which where you, you check in with friends by bumping phones together. But where it starts to get fun is that once you've been to a place enough, you unlock the ability to create your own thing to do there, to create your own challenge. So snap a picture of your favorite piece of art on the walls. Um, you know, build, build a, a, a tinfoil origami sculpture out of your burrito. Do something a little bit custom, a little bit unique. Snap a picture of you and your friends in front of the Eiffel Tower, you know, with your hand just as if it's touching the top. And so everyone plays this game, but also everyone who's playing has the opportunity to build the game by creating these fundamental core units of challenges, which are really just fun things to do that are a little bit more custom to each place than, than the check-in, which we're all pretty familiar with. So basically, uh, a couple of years ago, you must have seen Foursquare and thought, there's more to this that's possible? Was that the origin of the idea? Uh, so Scavenger actually got started uh, a couple months before Foursquare launched. Um, and and the, the, the assumption, uh, b believe it or not, and, and, and now it you know, has sort of come to, uh, come to reality, is that Facebook was going was gonna to do something with location-based social networking. And, and you know, they have. And we always assumed that when it came to uh, location-based and social networking, uh, the hard part wasn't the location it was the 500 million users. And what we wanted to do is something actually pretty fundamentally new. We, we, we get grouped in with the Foursquares and Gowallas and Loops and Whirls and Rumbles, and, and, and yes, there are absolutely a lot of similarities, but what we're trying to do is take this theory of uh, enabling the game mechanics that motivate you know, billions and billions of hours of gameplay in virtual worlds and bringing those into the real world. We, we think that the last decade was the decade of social, where we very effectively digitized social connections, but the next decade is not the decade of social. That's already been built. There's already a framework. It's called Facebook. Uh, the next decade is the decade of games, 
where rather than trying to traffic in social connections, we actually digitize human motivation. And we wanted to build a, a framework for that. And so we decided we'd build you know, one big game uh, and, and one big game engine. So uh, is it something you think, when we talk about game mechanics, we, we understand the value of checking in. So you, if you're checking in with Force Gary Goala, um, you get to have a permanent record of the fact that you went there, just like a photo. You get to tell your friends where you are at that very moment. You get to see where your friends are. If somebody happens to be in the airport at the same time, you get that serendipity, although it doesn't happen too often. Um, but now you're talking about, okay, I want to make a game out of you know, taking a picture of the Eiffel Tower or making origami out of your burrito, tinfoil, or all this kind of stuff. Is that gonna, who's that going to appeal to? Is that like for kids? Is it for young adults? And is there an age divide here? Because it seems to me many adults might be like, hey, I I'm not really interested in doing this kind of silly game stuff. I, I got work to do. I got a family. I is this relegated to, to teens and, and young adults? Sure. So it it's a great question. And, and, and I'll give some, some data to sort of point out wh where scavengers come from. Uh, and, you know, quick, quick history on that. We spent our um, you know, first year, year and a half building out the game engine side of things and only launched into the consumer space about uh, 23 weeks ago now. Um, so what we found is that Scavenger tends to appeal to people based on where they're playing. We've got a pretty wide demographic of people who are playing and in our first 20 weeks we went from zero to half a million players um, and we're now uh, about 600, north of 600,000 aiming to be at a million by end of year or you know, early next. And it's not just kids, um, by any means. Actually, our, our core demo, well, there are wide tales of sort of the 17 to 34 crowd that tends to be adopting this type of stuff. And what we've found is that the casual nature of Scavenger, the fact that it can be just a six second experience and lots of people check in on Scavenger and get the utility out of that, but the fact that it can go a bit deeper with these things that are custom built to be relevant to that place. And yes, the, the examples I gave were, were a little bit gimmicky just to sort of push the, you know, the idea of what you can do with that. But most of the challenges, most of the custom things to do at places are really just fun, additional scripted activities that might take you an extra six, an extra 10 seconds, but are much more relevant, much more real to that location and a little bit more fun than, than just hitting a button everywhere you go. So uh, what do I get from your answer? Is, it, is there an age divide, yes or no? Have you uh, seen one? We, we have seen that Scavenger as a game and as a game layer tends to map the ages of the people who would go to those places. So Scavengers run uh, some great campaigns with Journeys. Uh, they appeal to young teens. And so we have a lot of young teens playing Scavenger at malls. Uh, we've also done stuff with the Smithsonian uh, and even with the US Navy. And you know, the people who play Scavenger um, you know, that start playing at the Smithsonian and then continue playing through the rest of their, of their daily lives are, are a much older crowd. Uh, Got so, it, so okay. So it's, it is specific to the, the mission, so to speak. Um, and so if you did something at the Louvre where I said, see these five famous women, the Venus de Milo, Mona Lisa, to get the badge of the you know, five women of the Louvre, hey, that might appeal to people in their 30s or 40s uh, who have iPhones because it would just be nice and rewarding to get credit that you saw the five? Is that, is that the dynamic? I want to get credit? So uh, that's a, another great question and it sort of gets to why do people actually play Scavenger? You know, what, why have we had this, this, this sort of what we consider to be really fast user growth? I mean, we entered 23 weeks ago into a really competitive space. Um, we got to half a million users in 20 weeks. I think Foursquare took a year and two months to do that. Um, I actually don't know about Goala's user numbers at the moment. Twitter back in the day was a year and a half to do that. And, and the reason why it's been growing that fast is that Scavenger as a way to experience the real world adds a little bit of depth. It adds some customization. It's a what we consider to be a more fun, a more engaging experience. And because we've made it this game layer that everyone can build, there are now a thousand enterprises um, uh, paying to build on Scavenger, but also tons more building for free for local businesses. It's always free. And they're basically creating a more customized location-based experience at their places and uh, more and more often adding a second game element. The main game element is a challenge. What I do, I can build that at any place. Adding a second game element called a reward, which sort of broadly defines what I can get at a place. Um, and so some people play Scavenger just because it's fun. Some people play because it's social. Um, and a lot of people play because players on Scavenger to date have gotten uh, a million and a half dollars worth of free stuff so far. Uh, and that's ticking up pretty aggressively every day uh, as they go places, do challenges, earn points, and have fun and unlock rewards. So if I own a local uh, cafe, I can say, uh, come here and uh, not only check in, but uh, take a picture of the cafe and share it on Twitter. And if you share a picture on Twitter, I'm going to give you a um, buy one, get one free uh, coffee. 
So o almost exactly right, except that, that you don't have to share it on Twitter. Uh, ah. it, it, it's, it's really just about it being fun. And so it might be, you know, snap a picture of your coffee or what's your favorite flavor of coffee here? Or like we have this ice cream shop here in Boston that creates all these crazy flavors. And it's, if you could suggest any type of ice cream flavor, what would it be and what would be in it? And, and the point isn't to, um, people do share these things a lot to Facebook and Twitter. It's very popular, but um, the, the, the way you unlock rewards is you just go to places, you, you play scavenger, you, you can just check in if you want, that's totally fine. There are also these fun challenges which are a little more custom. You can do the social check-in with your friends. You earn points by doing that and that enables you to unlock reward. Uh, but we're, we're careful to never um, overtly incentivize sharing because scavenger is sort of meant to be you know, clean and fun and, 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 and really just a game. Uh, take me to the uh, first um, financing of scavenger. Obviously, you're a young entrepreneur. Were you part of Y Combinator or Techstars? I mean, you dropped out of Princeton. Did, um, so obviously, you come from, I'm going to guess, a wealthy family. Did daddy give you a million dollars to start this? What happened? Um, so, so I did drop out of Princeton. Um, okay. Uh, I, I've been doing startups uh, since, since I was 12. I founded my first company uh, back then. It failed gloriously. But my, my second company called Postcard Tech, uh, which I founded with about $1,000 uh, that I'd actually made off of doing um, a what I would call a high-tech lemonade stand in Boston. I got, I got the, the permits to do it on Newbury Street and bought water for 15 cents and sold them for $3 and made like three or $400 a day. It was pretty good. My second company, um, we set up a factory in, 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 you know, started producing things in Hong Kong. Um, we made CD postcards, went really well, set up a proper factory there of eight people, shipped them to Boston. Um, that was never a big company, but it made a ton of money. Uh, and so uh, w when I went to Princeton, um, I pitched this to the business plan competition. They gave us $5,000. I started financing it out of my, um, the profits from the last company and then got accepted in, into something which is like Y Combinator, but it's called Dream Adventures uh, based in Philadelphia. Uh, and they gave us $35,000 um, and space to hang out in the summer and said, hey, you've got three months. Uh, don't leave, don't sleep, don't eat anything but ramen noodles, build something great, and, uh, and if, you, if you work hard enough, you know, perhaps, uh, perhaps someone will be lucky enough to give you a lot of money. And, and luckily that happened. How do you think uh, you wound up becoming so entrepreneurial at such a young age? Is your dad a maniacal entrepreneur? So my, my dad is an entrepreneur. Uh, he's in the biotech space, uh, which um, is a <laughs> is a very rough space to be an entrepreneur in, just because of the uh, I, you know I, I get very impatient when I have to like wait ten minutes you know during a server push or have to you know wait for some new release of some software to come out there. They've got sort of ten year approval cycles, which he's much more patient than I am. Uh, and and my mom is a, is an SVP of finance at uh, uh, what is now Morgan Stanley Smith Barney, but I think was at some point Citigroup Smith Barney. Uh, and so she sort of had me balancing my checkbook since I was five and my dad has always been entrepreneurial and you know has just sort of put forth this idea that you you know you figure things out and and I think I think that's where I got it from. Hey uh, if you have a question for Seth you can do so two different ways one you can tweet it and just put the pound twist hashtag Tyler is watching the pound twist hashtag so just ask your question on Twitter or you can ask it in the Ustream chat room we're at ustream.com slash this weekend which is every show on the this weekend network is there Ask a question by just putting a Q and then a colon, right? Yes. And it will put the little question mark there. Tyler, do yeah. you or the audience have a question? Yes. Yeah, if the audience has a question, tell us Stephen, who the person's name. Yeah, Stephen Wise was asking how, um, obviously you make money by charging the people that are promoting these campaigns. Can you dive into what those look like? Yeah, there's, I had a little confusion about that as well, Seth. You said you had, it was free for local businesses, it would always be free, but then you said you had a thousand businesses charging. Uh, how, how does that work? Is it a freemium or something? It's similar to a freemium, and, and, and the, the way you should think about this is the vast majority of everything about Scavenger is free. Uh, it's always free to play. Um, if you're an individual, it's always free to build. Uh, everyone gets five free capacity, and capacity is the phrase we use to, to count the number of challenges that you've built. You build a challenge at a location, you build a reward at a location. Everyone gets five for free. If you're a local business, it's free. Um, uh, where people pay us and where we actually make money is that if you're a larger institution or a larger enterprise, um, say a university like Harvard or Princeton or Tufts or a museum uh, like the Smithsonian or the Museum of Fine Arts or uh, regional brands or uh, national brands like uh, AT&T and Zipcar and Sony and Warner Brothers and GameStop, all of whom have built on Scavenger, they want to build many, many more game elements uh, in the real world. And there, they basically buy capacity from us. Um, they totally self-serve. You build it online. Uh, you create these very fun things to do at places. You create these rewards that you can unlock at places. Completely software as a service sort of dashboard to the game layer. And um, uh, luckily, that's been a phenomenal business model for us. We, in, in our first year with zero consumer offering, this is just when we were doing it, you know, um, uh, sort of building out the game engine and kind of having people sign on before there was really any consumer offering. We did over a million in revenue. Uh, we've done 
up many, many multiples of that this year, and we'll do many, many multiples of that again next year. And the reason for that is that it's, it's not an advertising model. It's software as a service. It's basically getting people to build out the game layer with us, and they get huge benefit by attracting traffic, increasing engagement, activating fun at the locations they care about. They invite people in to become part of the scavenger ecosystem, and then the game just gets bigger and better for, for everyone that's currently playing. So, another question? Yeah, well, so the creativity of these games comes from the, not from Scavenger necessarily, but from the campaign they make up their own. It, it seems the audience yeah. or the local business right. or the national business, right. anybody can make it. So if Tyler wants to do, you know, Tyler's uh, Santa Monica haunts, go to these five places and you get the, you know, uh, Insight by Tyler badge, you could do that, correct, Seth? Sure, and I should clarify that the vast majority of what people are building is more about building this challenge out of place. So it's not necessarily go to end places, it's that when you come to Toscanini's Ice Cream, uh, which is this, this great ice cream shop near the office, which I go to way too often, if you come to Toscanini's Ice Cream, you can check in here, and you can snap a picture here, and you can say something here, and you can do the social check-in, but you can also do this great challenge we've built, which is to actually go into the back room and snap a picture of what they call the ice cream factory, which is they actually manufacture the ice cream on site, so they've got this crazy contraption, and so you go and find it and snap a picture. And so what people build are those things which you can think of like a three-dimensional check-in, like a check-in plus but you customize it and create it at your own places. So we know you're in the building, but to prove you're not just outside, checking in outside, you gotta go find the big ice cream machine. I kinda like that concept. Um, and it's, this is to build engagement for these businesses. So if the business, I would think, gets more engaged with the customer, that would follow that they're gonna remember it, talk about it, fall in love with it more, et cetera. What have uh, your clients told you the result of you doing these sort of in-store uh, tasks games are? What's the result? So, so, so th there, there are a couple key results and we basically delineate them as, you know, it attracts more traffic because people Facebook about it, they tweet about it and what we call a, a challenge, you know, this premium content, this photo I took of that ice cream machine, uh, this reward I unlocked, whatever, whatever it is that I've done, this actual story I've done at the place, when they post that to Facebook or Twitter, it gets literally an order of magnitude higher in terms of comments and likes and retweets than a basic check-in, whether that check-in came from Scavenger or from Foursquare or from Gowalla or from Facebook because it's it's, it's real content, it's premium content. So they attract a lot of traffic from sort of the social media ether. Uh, they increase engagement. Um, they obviously activate a lot of buzz. And in the end, um, you know, for local businesses, they end up increasing sales for people like the Smithsonian or you know, the US Navy or many of these universities where they're not trying to increase sales. They're just trying to make the experience of being on campus, of being in the museum more fun, more engaging. Um, they basically get people exploring more and having a better time. And, and uh, they get great value out of that and, and we get um, you know, at a very, very high conversion rate of people who continue playing scavenger wherever they go. Um, and at, at many, many places, no one's built anything custom yet. So all you can do is, you know, the basic things, check in, snap a picture, do the social check in. But then uh, because everyone can build it out, you know, the most popular places tend to start having much more interesting content, much more interesting things to do. Uh, Tyler, any other questions? I'm curious to see, have, have you had thoughts and somebody asked this, I got to give them credit. Um, thank you very much, CB. Uh, kind of begs the question of an educational use, but I'm also curious of like a dating use might be kind of interesting. Yeah, so uh, wh wh what activity can I do in the dating field? Can I, uh, if I get a girl's phone number and, and take a photo, well, I guess if we took a photo <laughs> of the photo, that the phone number, that would work. If I can actually get a girl to talk to me and get a photo of that, does that get me some free ice cream? What, any, any aspirations for dating or meeting people, socialization? Or the education uh, thing, because it seems nat a natural yes. fit that you would. It does. You go to, you get to every class for a month, and then you know you don't get kids to show up to class on time, not tardy yeah. or whatever. Uh, are professors using this to uh, get people uh, to actually attend their lectures, and are people meeting girls with it? Are nerds uh, meeting girls? It, it, it begs the important question: Is has anyone gotten laid with this yet? There you go. <laughs> Tyler said it, not me. <laughs> So, so, so uh, as, as you can imagine, you're know, being in the tech field, we're always looking to solve you know, the real pain points in our life. And, and I think that, that the ultimate goal for Scavenger is when I can solve my, my personal dating deficiencies with, with some app, uh, you know, that would be wonderful. But, but Scavenger, um, we, Scavenger isn't really built for that. We, we have seen really creative uses of Scavenger for that. And I guess this really gets to the point that Scavenger isn't really built for anything per se. We've built a game layer on top of the world and other people build out that game with us. So in the dating field, what we've seen that's actually pretty creative is uh, uh, in New York, someone built out this great um, 
you know, series of challenges, and this one is, is you know, go to, go to end places. It's what we call a trek, similar to a Guala trip, just a list of places. But instead of just checking it in at each one, um, you know, there are challenges that you do with them and there are rewards you can unlock. And they created a, a date night trek where they said, hey, you know, no one knows what to do on a date. It's difficult to plan it. Just play scavenger. Start here. You know, first we're going to go to the park. Then we're going to go to a movie theater. Then we've already picked the restaurant for you. And there's a reward at the restaurant. So if you do the social check-in and earn four points together, you get a free appetizer. And they basically uh, built on scavenger on this game layer a way to make dating a little bit more fun and a little bit less awkward. Which, uh, if I weren't spending all of my time on scavenger, would definitely be something I'd take advantage of. Uh, and, and, and to answer your question as well, in the education field, there are 350 universities building on scavenger already. Um, they use it uh, mainly for you know, engagement on campus, attracting prospective students, getting people to explore, getting people to engage with the football team down at the stadium or what have you. Um, but we've started to see more and more uses both within museums and within universities of people uh, building on scavenger to uh, incentivize getting people to go to class, to check out a certain piece of art, to discover something cool. And because it is this very interactive experience, there's, there's absolutely a lot that can be done with it there. And, and our goal is to build the framework and, and let you know, all these people jumping on board play around with it and, and build what they will. So if the, touching on that framework aspect that kind of is like coded language for an API coming soon, I guess? Yeah, is there an API to build this stuff, or did you just build it in with the sort of wig, uh, WYSIWYG at the uh, site? So, so right, right now, uh, we, we have an API, but it's private. Uh, and we've got some partners using it, but we're still working out, you know, as, as always with API, some of the private, privacy uh, questions, and we want to make sure we've got all that figured out, obviously, before we launch it. Uh, but right now, the way you build on Scavenger is meant to be about as easy as updating your Facebook status or tweeting. Uh, you log into Scavenger. Uh, there are a bunch of templates you select from, build a challenge, build a reward, build a trek. And it's meant to be uh, sophisticated enough that you can create these really interesting, really creative experiences at locations, but easy enough that you, know, you and me and, and my mom can you know, log on and build it and, and, and get started without, without needing to think about it at all, except for what they think would be fun at that place. And one thing you definitely don't need to think about is getting a .co domain name. That's a pretty good segue, right? <laughs> I'm trying over here. I'm trying. Seth, do you want any .co, .co domain names uh, yet? I, I do not have any .co domain names. I do have a .gr. Our short URL is scaven.gr uh, from Greece. And, and we do use SendGrid. So to put in a plug for them, ah. we release their service. And uh, SendGrid is, uh, uh, you're very satisfied, would you say? Very satisfied indeed. Awesome. And one thing, I, I guarantee you, you'll be satisfied if you got scavenger.co. And, uh, you know, they're, they're able to do one letter domains. And so i.co uh, will be the next one that's available, joining o.co, which Overstock bought, t.co, which Twitter bought, and x.co, which GoDaddy bought. Over 600,000 .co domains have been registered. That's extraordinary. Uh, and, you know, their tagline is create your opportunity. Not a lot of great domains left. I mean, Seth, you had to take the vowels out of your name to get it, which is kind of cool. I'm on the board of GDGT, uh, and I, I love that naming convention, but that just shows you how hard it is. Uh, and, but not at .co. I mean, if they've only, it's tremendous success that they've sold 600,000 in such a short period of time. And I'm very proud of the fact that the This Week in Audience has been part of that success for them. Uh, however, that means this, this probably, I don't know, 10 million really good domain names, that means they're only 6% of the way there. You've got 94% of the good domains are still available. Go to .co, grab a domain name, and uh, make sure that you uh, thank .co. Uh, what's their Twitter handle again? I think it's D-O-T-C-O, right? At .co. Uh, I believe that's it. But man, I can't thank these guys enough. They've been great supporters of ours. And I've got a bunch of .co domains myself. Um, Seth, there's this New York Times article that came out. Yeah. D-O-T-C-O on Twitter. Is it D-O-T-C-O? So yeah. thank at SendGrid and .co. Um, Seth, I, I see this New York Times article. Um, it says that you're insane or probably a little manic, uncontrollable, bipolar. I don't know what it said about you exactly, but it said something. I it said bipolar, but yeah. <laughs> I think it said that you were uh, uh, socially awkward. I don't know. What, it, what did it say exactly? That you had a narcissistic personality disorder or something? I don't know. And I'm making all that stuff up. Obviously, you're not. But it did say something about entrepreneurs, the great ones, uh, need to be a little bit uh, unbalanced, unreasonable, and perhaps have a mental defect, I think is basically what they're saying, but not so much of a mental defect that they are uh, incapable of you know, building a team and being successful. Um, how did you wind up in that story, and uh, how insane are you? Um, so I'll answer the questions in reverse order. Uh, I'm clearly completely nuts. 
Um, right. and, and, and the way I know this is that I was at a conference once and I'd gotten off a, I was giving a presentation, I'd got, you know, walked off the, off the, the stage and, and a, um, a reporter from a local university paper came up to me and asked me if I was crazy. Um, and, and the only thing I could think to respond was I, I just turned to her and really, you know, very, very friendly looking person. She said, are you crazy? And I turned to her and I go, oh, booga, 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 booga. And <laughs> like, of like six or seven hundred people really loud. And, and, and it was it was hilarious. It was just post the New York Times article. And I decided that that was, you know, that that was probably the only appropriate way to respond to that type of question. Um, so the answer is, am, am I actually crazy? No, no I, I, I don't think so. Um, but the, 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 the way I got involved with, with that uh, Times article is that they, um, uh, this uh, a reporter had been asking around and, he, and he'd asked a bunch of VCs and a bunch of other entrepreneurs that he'd said, you know, hey, can you recommend uh, to me someone I should talk to that is um, uh, building a very cool company, uh, building something big and also completely nuts. Um, and he, he asked about 10 people and I think that nine out of 10 of them mentioned me. Uh, so clearly someone thinks I'm nuts. And then he phoned and he said, hey, you know, I'm writing this piece on, on, on what is actually um, called hy hypomania. Um, uh, it's like the, the, the antithesis of manic depressive. It's like always, always manic, always excited. And he phoned me and he said, hey, are you, you know, are you building a cool company? And I said, absolutely. He said, are you building something really big? I said, definitely. He said, are you building something that you're really passionate about? I said, absolutely. He said, are you crazy? I said, yes. And, and that was probably the mistake. Um, ah, I, I probably ah. should have responded no at that point. Um, but then, then he, he came up to Boston and we chatted. And, and uh, you know, the, as you said, you know, jokingly, the article is about entrepreneurs being crazy. But, but in reality, the article is about entrepreneurs being dedicated to building something above all else. Uh, right. And I definitely am dedicated to building something above all else. Have you found in your career, I mean, I'm talking to you about your career, you're 21 or 22 years old, but you've done three companies, so kudos to you. Um, uh, have you found that there is some shortcoming on a personality basis that perhaps you have that does make you successful? So it's a double-edged sword. You know, this thing, maybe I piss some people off, maybe I alienate some people, but it, it sort of serves me well in uh, the growth of my companies. Is there something uh, well, you can put your finger on? I should check. J Jason, will you friend me on Facebook? <laughs> I will, we, then we will both have friends. We'll both yeah, get we our first each, friends. We, we can each have one. It'll be yes. phenomenal. I hear, I hear it's a very social experience that way. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, sh sure. I, I mean, I, I, I focus on, on, on Scavenger, and, on, and it's always been this way with whatever company I'm, I'm trying to build. And, and, and the, last, you know, the second one was successful. The first one totally failed. Um, but the second one was not big. It was, it was, it was you know, made money, but it was not big. Scavenger is going to be something very big. And, and, and yeah, so, so I tend to focus on that um, exclusively. I, I moved up to Boston and, and you know, very uh, specifically don't, don't really have a, um, a hyperactive social life up here. Uh, you know, the goal is that uh, Scavenger is this very cool thing that I'm trying to build. I, I sleep at the office. I work uh, you know, 16 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, and the reason I can justify that is that there are a lot of people out there who love playing Scavenger. There are a lot of people out there who love building Scavenger. And we've built a team of now, you know, I think over 40 of, of the brightest, most interesting, most intelligent people in the world who are all dedicated to doing this. And because I get to spend you know, 16 plus hours a day hanging out with them, uh, I, I feel pretty fulfilled on the social side of life and I also get to have this great fun of, of just building something awesome. Uh, no girlfriend though, huh? Uh, no, and I think, I think that gets back to, you know, will, will Scavenger eventually morph into a very effective dating tool? I, I, I've tried to stay away from that because it, it can't just be about my problems, you know? Uh, you and me would like it, but it's got to be got to be built for other people. Hey, I'm a married guy, and just for the record, I never had a problem getting girls in New York because I had a magazine. Uh, having a very successful startup company, I mean, that's a pretty big icebreaker, I think. Uh, all you have to do is figure out, you know, like some of your some people who work with you, or you know, they they have to go out to a bar at some point where there are females that you can talk to. I think you'll I think you're going to do just fine, Seth. Um, it's great having you on the program. Continued success. I've been using the application. I think it's very clever. It's obviously very well put together. And uh, wow, you're crushing it. I mean, to be raising money from Google Ventures, Highland Capital Partners, who I know, um, th this is not insignificant. And to get this level of um, companies involved, like AT&T and National Geographic, Zipcar, uh, Sony, Tesla, Warner Brothers, very significant. Uh, I, I wish you continued success. And congratulations on raising all the money. And uh, yeah, you only get to go around the planet once, so you might as well extend all of your energy and do what you love. And there'll be time for girls later. As my grandfather would tell me, keep your, keep your eyes on the books, not the babes. And in this case, it's keep your eyes on the startups, not the ladies. Cool. Well, Jason, th thanks so much for having me, and, and happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. This Sunday. Cheers. Uh, thanks for being on the program. I'll see you when I'm in Boston. Cheers. I, I like this guy. You know, like, 
you, you read the New York Times story and you think, um, and, and this is what a lot of, I mean, I suffer from this a little bit. A lot of Zuckerberg clearly suffers from it. You know, you read about somebody in the New York Times, you're like, oh my God, this guy's a maniac or whatever. But then you meet him in person, you have a little conversation with him, he's human. You know, I mean, that's the lesson I learned with Zuckerberg is I, you know, when I started seeing him in person and talking to him, I'm like, oh, this poor kid, he's like on stage having a panic attack and I'm criticizing him. And I, then I feel terrible about criticizing him as brutally as I did. But, you know, I've, and I, it's like I was justified in criticizing the thing, the behaviors they were doing, but was I justified in criticizing the individual? Perhaps not, you know? It'll be, I think it'll be yet to be seen. Like, people used to criticize Bill Gates the same way you were criticizing yes. Zuckerberg and Microsoft. And, right? But it was justified at that time because that he time. was known for just crucifying people yes. and brutalizing. Ruthless, and I think... Uh, Beyond ruthless. I think Zuckerberg's very influenced by Bill Gates. I don't think right. that no one argues so that So he point. sort of likes it. But hopefully, he's also inspired by the philanthropic uh, angle Bill Gates has taken. Like, all the wealth that he's accumulated, he's giving back in huge ways. Yeah, I think I, I never worry about the polarization of wealth. I, be, I worry about people not wanting to be wealthy. Um, because if you don't have that drive and desire, you're not going to do anything great in the world. Um, it, wealth is the byproduct of doing great things. Whether it's wealth for your nonprofit or for a for-profit, and the burden of wealth, as you can see from, Zuck uh, from Zuckerberg giving $100 million, and he's not liquid right now, so I mean, to give away $100 million, I guess he gave it in stock, um, but Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, but it seemed, uh, Ted Turner, I mean, anytime these people get a large sum of money, billions of dollars, they wind up giving it away because it's too much guilt. Maybe. It's overwhelming. You know how guilty I felt for years with my family, like, oh my God, my brother's running into burning buildings, you know, and I can basically retire at a young age. And I just, it, it, it Fs with your mind. And I'm on a very tiny, tiny scale, but they're on a huge scale. It, it Fs with your mind in a very big way. You already see uh, Zuckerberg State living in a very modest, modest place house. and giving 150 to the schools. And yeah, he, he lives in a $2 million house. He's given awesome. a, if, if that's, nine figures to the if, school. If the benefit of... If that was you, you'd be buying a nine figure house and giving two figures to the school. If, I'm just saying, if, it's, if the, the net net at the end of the day of people's photos being jeopardized is yeah. that schools get millions of dollars, I'm all for it. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, like, screw everybody's privacy. Sure. Uh, unless, of course, it's a teacher who uh, happens to be gay or something, and their parents wind up seeing him at, you know, some Halloween party, uh, you know, with his friends, and they're all dressed in a provocative way, of, or what would be perceived as provocative by the was parents it? of school kids. That was, that was Google's actual example. And that was Google's actual example. I'm yeah. using it for a reason, because yeah. it actually happened. Yeah. Um, you know, then, hey, maybe it's not so cool. Right. You know, so, you know, so the, but I think what's going to happen is, as, as, as entrepreneurs mature, and they get more life experience, then they start realizing, like, wow, he's got a girlfriend, right? They'll get engaged at some point, uh, uh, God willing, or whatever, and I uh, hope he's happy and gets married. And then when he's got a wife and somebody checks him in at the Spearmint Rhino when they're in Vegas for CES, he's not going to appreciate it, trust me. You know? Right. I'm not saying this happened to me. Right. <laughs> but I, I was at the Spearmint Rhino with Kara Swisher from the Wall Street Journal and she checked me in. <laughs> And I was like, you don't need to be checking me in at the Spearmint Rhino. This is not good for me. You don't think my wife, my wife subscribes to one person on Twitter. She's got a secret Twitter account. You know who she subscribes to? You. Me. Yeah. She doesn't need to see me at Spearmint Rhino with Cara Swisher. Anyway, uh, you know who else uh, you need to fall in love with? There's no more sponsors. That's it. I was just okay. joking. No segue there. Uh, hey, it's time for an Ask Jason. It's time for an Ask Jason, and we have on the line Vadim. Did I pronounce it correctly, Vadim? Yeah, that's right, Jason. Vadim, Hello, I want Jason and Tyler. Thanks for having me on the show. I want to thank you, uh, first, for having a Brooklyn shirt on, second, for using a proper headset and microphone. I've literally been on 10 angel investing calls this week. Nine of them have been a disaster. I literally had an angel investing demo where I'm, you know, the mm -hmm. concept of the call is I'm going to possibly invest Money, like, right. and they're doing it at a cafe on Skype without a headset. And I'm like hearing, like, this is what I'm hearing. Yeah, so our this is what our startup's going to be doing. 
And I'm like, I, I can't hear you. <laughs> and I really want to know about your startup. And then Wi-Fi's, you know, somebody in the cafe is downloading BitTorrent porn or something. And oh my God, you know. Anyway, rule number one. Forget about it. it's me or anybody. Anybody you're talking about in a business context. A landline phone is required. The only thing that can, you can substitute for a landline phone is a Skype connection with an Ethernet cable on a high-speed connection, knowing that nobody else on the network is going to F it up and that you're not downloading This Week in Startups on iTunes in the background. When I do Skype, I shut everything else down but my browser and I go to minimum number of tabs. Anyway, it's, I, we, it's almost like you have to give this lesson. I wish all startups could get a lesson in how to pitch. We need to do that. We need to do it for the launch conference. Hmm. Anyway, uh, Vadim, you're calling from the 604. Where is it? That's in beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia. Excellent. Uh, you have a question for us. Let's hear it. Yeah, so uh, by the way, I'm a big fan of the show, and uh, I'm Great. watching the shows uh, retroactively now, uh, catching up on all the ones that I missed. But Great. I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York, so Where I in came Brooklyn? up as uh, Silicon Valley, uh, uh, sorry, Silicon Alley entrepreneur. Yeah. About the same time as you did, so uh, it's Where in great Brooklyn? to see you and your success. Uh, in Brighton Beach, actually. Oh, Brighton Beach, you're kidding. Yeah. Uh, I used to take the B4 bus to Brighton Beach when I was a kid. On uh, Saturdays, we would take our, this is, I'm not kidding. Someone would come around, we have nothing to do, my parents would kick us out of the house and they'd say, come back at 6. They literally <laughs> would say, you cannot come back in the house until 6 p.m. And this is everybody on the block. We would take our jeans, we'd cut the ends of our jeans off, we'd get on the bus, we'd have maybe two towels. Because we didn't have enough towels in the house. So we, they, and my mom wouldn't let us take the nice ones. So we have like eight kids with three towels. And we get uh, a cooler and we fill it with soda and sandwiches that we'd make at home, mom would make. And we'd go on the bus, Brighton Beach, and we'd go hang out on the beach in Brighton Beach. Anyway, yeah, there Brighton you go. Beach is great. Yeah. Okay, so let's hear your question. So my question is uh, let's say that you are a company in development, you have your startup going, you have a team assembled around your concept, and you're kind of ramping up and you have a beta set up. Um, how do you take that uh, as, a, as a combination and turn it into a value proposition for your investors to get you to the next level? Or maybe I can ask, like, what are the best practices for taking your startup to the next level once you get to that point? This is a great question. So basically, you were able to assemble some sort of a team the team was able to build some sort of a beta of the product. You have some users using the beta, and now you want to leverage this in order to raise money. Now, exactly. is that correct? Did I get it right, Vadim? That's correct. Yeah, you nailed it. OK. So uh, assuming that you've done all the things you've heard about on this show, like have a world-class domain name, .co, not a bad choice. Uh, you have world-class design and a logo. That's you know top shelf, great UX, good user interface. Um, no excuse not to have those things in today's day and age. You know, one person working at home can have a great domain name, great logo, and great UX. So you have to have it. Um, if you have great traction with a small number of people, and you can show some variable or metric where people are addicted to it. So look, we created Scavenger, and we've got 100 people using it. And these eight people are creating, on average, three challenges a week. You know, if 8% of the people in the system create challenges and they do you know, uh, even just one a week or they do just 10 a year, we're going to have so many challenges for those other people to do. It's going to be incredible and it's going to inspire this kind of traction and viral loop. So you could sell that, the, the data that the early users are using, the beta. You can sell technological achievement. Like, here is a, here's our competitor, and look at all the things we have that they don't. And we've done this more with less, and if we had a little bit of money, we could go even faster. Uh, or three, uh, this is the third thing, you have some way of acquiring customers that is unique and scalable and fast and cheap. So you say, hey, you know, um, our other customers, uh, you know, they have to do search engine marketing and it's really inefficient because they have to hire people and they're paying this amount. But we're using Trata and we've got, you know, this much lower than them. Uh, and we've got an SEO strategy that does this or whatever it is. And we've got some distribution. Uh, that would be a third thing that you could sell them on. Uh, and the fourth thing you could sell them on is um, we have uh, this product is going to be released to the public and we've got a journalist and these other people ready to cover it. Uh, and we think that it's going to take us from this much revenue and this many customers to this. So 
these are all uh, what I would call, they fall into two buckets, performance or promise. And so when a product is released, like let's say Mahalo, if I were, if I were to raise a C round for Mahalo, I would be pitching people on primarily performance. Hey, we had 20 million people watch our videos on YouTube. We had 12 million uniques coming to Mahalo, and we have these features, and we're number 160 or 70 in Quantcast. Performance, performance, performance. Uh, but then I might add a little bit of promise at the end, a little sprinkle of the pixie dust, and say Mahalo 4.0 is coming out January 23rd at the DLD conference. Let me show you all these advanced features, world class, and look how it looks on an iPad, and look at this system for people creating pages and how beautiful and easy it is. We've taken page creation down 5x. Those are that's the combination I like. Promise, uh, performance, 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 promise. Um, other people will do promise, 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 but without performance, it might ring a little hollow. Tyler, what are your thoughts? What um, would you do? You got your beta, you got your team. You want to maybe get a little cash in the bank. I think you have to create some element of wow, um, and that can be from the user side or somehow. It depends on if the investors themselves are potential customers or not. I mean, in, in half the cases they may be, in half the cases they may not be. And it's in the or for their spouses. Right. Oh, that, that's, that's actually very good. Or a family member, like a right. child. So they have somebody that they're related to. Somebody in their orbit right. loves it. Exactly. So it's, I think that is an also an easy way because then it becomes personal. Even if it's not, they're not your target user. Yeah. Somebody in their inner circle is, and you've managed to get that person excited about it. Yeah, and, and I think that wow factor is a great addition to what I said. So you got performance yeah. and promise for me, but you also have the wow from Tyler. And I, I would not discount what Tyler's saying about wow. Um, I've seen people, I've invested based on wow. Yep. I've seen people invest on wow. I've seen people invest on wow more than performance, to be totally honest. Yep. Vadim, does that help? Yeah, that's great. I'm, I'm glad you guys said that because that's kind of like, the loose ends that we're trying to tie together and really push that wow factor. I mean, but and, uh, the wow thing is an actual literal wow. Like they have, you have to get the word have wow sell. come out of their mouth. Yeah. yeah. They, or if they, even if they mouth it, they just go. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a loud wow. It should be wow. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. But you have to create something that a nod. causes a physical, emotional reaction and and deconstruct it somehow. How do you? Yeah. What in your product is hitting some emotional point and really? put your finger right on that nerve. Yeah, I think that's correct. Uh, well done, Vadim, a great question, and I'm sorry I talk so fast, but you'll be able to listen to it on the replay probably three hours after the show. Uh, let's do the news. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Vadim. Bye, Tyler. Bye. Cheers. Thing starts going really well on like all of the different projects, it just charges me up. So it's like it's one of the reasons I like to multitask a little bit because if I get like, oh, Mahalo is going great, launch is going great, this week startup's going great, you know, and like five things, or my writing's going well, it just all cascades. I just love it. It's something about performing well, <laughs> you know, it just it is inherently uh, increases performance and joy for me at least. I don't know, if, and I assume for everybody that when you're actually in the zone. It just it makes everything so much more fun, you know. It does, and it feels like everybody in the team's in the zone. I just see everybody performing at a high level. What's in the news? Well, on November eighth, Facebook officially filed a trademark infringement lawsuit against Lame Book, a funny blog that aggregates lame pictures and funny status updates and more from the multi-billion-dollar behemoth. Facebook has taken this ribbing to heart and has been actively removing fan pages, links, and likes to anything Lame Book related. Of course, this piqued my curiosity instantly, and I went immediately to Lamebook and found this. So it's, it's like the hand of God has come down onto the site to teach us a very serious lesson. And if you take a look at it, basically what they're saying is, uh, if, you, if you kind of scroll in, if you can get a little bit closer to, to what they're saying there, yeah. Basically, they're, you know, someone is trying to make a knock-knock joke about, about Facebook, and you see Facebook essentially go in and say, uh, Kev, I think if I were you, I'd stop. T I'd stop the joke right there. Can you get on it? Which one is it? This? No, nope, it's not that one. Go down a little bit. Oh, I see. Let's see. I didn't realize it was all. Well, in any case, yes. basically what it is is Lamebook is claiming that it's clearly a parody of the larger site and thus protected under the First Amendment of the Constitution. Um, 
you know. <laughs> anyway, there's a lot. I see a lot. I see. I get the point now. I'm seeing. Yeah. There's a lot of like people doing lame stuff on Facebook, and they're syndicating it. Right. I mean, yes. is this face? Is this what Facebook face should be doing? Should they be censoring what's on um, or parodies of of the of the site? Facebook. Uh, anybody using the word book, just like anybody who uses the word pod or Amazon, mm -hmm. um, is likely to cause some level of confusion with the major brand out there. So if you have Oogle, and somebody did a, there's been a bunch of Oogles, some porn related, and those have gotten uh, letters, and uh, Facebook would do lame book, or this book, or that book. Um, so if there is a likelihood of confusion, then they're justified, with the exception of parody. And this clearly is parody, so it's uh, unbelievably lame of uh, Facebook to go after them. They should get a sense of humor. Yeah, I think it's just really frightening to think about them becoming the next evil empire. Yeah, I mean, they clearly are, and they're very successful, and that tends to be what happens. People will take themselves a little too seriously when they get big, and you have to realize there's so much at stake right now. I mean, tens of billions of dollars are at stake, and for many individuals, I would even say there's thousands of people who are either going to be worth hundreds of thousands to millions to tens of millions to hundreds of millions of dollars based on this. Which is why if you criticize Facebook, which I did in the industry a couple of times in a pretty harsh way that got picked up probably more than I deserve or the, more than my reasons deserve, um, you will create a lot of enemies very quickly. And so that, I mean, that's why I sort of backed off of it. I'm like, you know, I have my opinion, but I'm not willing to risk my company, Mahalo, on it. Like, and, and damage the other people who are working here to build something special. Um, so there's just a lot at stake. They have no sense of humor. And if you criticize them, they don't take it well. Uh, they need to get a sense of humor, uh, clearly. Tyler? It's, it's obviously protected. From a legal standpoint, like, you could go to, you know, anyone that, you know, goes online can figure out very quickly that there's no case here in terms of trademark because it's purely um, yeah. the, 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 a the, spoof. The question a judge would ask here, mm -hmm. or a good uh, attorney mm -hmm. would say... Uh, Did anyone confuse this? When you go to Lane Book here... Yeah. Uh, do, are you confused that this is run by Mark Zuckerberg in the Facebook group? And the answer is obviously no. People are not stupid. Next story. Two startups introducing socialized e-commerce receive funding this week. Yard Seller and Supply, which actually is spelled S-V-P-P-L-Y, but I'm assuming it's Supply. Yard Seller received $5 million in a Series A round and is poised to be the eBay of Facebook, while Supply, a social shopping site, just received 500000 in seed funding. Oodle currently runs the classified apps, also known as Marketplace for Facebook. With so much activity in the social e-commerce space, what does this mean for e-commerce giants today? Um, this is a space that is near to my heart because I was on the board of a company called This Next that was doing social shopping, just like Stylehive, and I think they want to, they may have actually bought Stylehive. And so the concept here is, you know, when you uh, shop uh, in the real world, you, socialization might take place. We might all go shopping someday at, you know, American Apparel, or The Gap, or Barney's, and I might say, hey, how do I look in this? You might say, oh, I, you know, I went to this store and they have great stuff, you should go there. Um, and we influence each other in our purchases. But online, where are the other people influencing you? In the reviews, well, those aren't your friends. Those are just anybody, and a lot of those are astroturfed. Um, so maybe it's not super social. Uh, this person, people who bought this also bought that. Sort of social, but again, I don't know those people. So the premise of this next style hive and these uh, sites is that social, if done right, might influence uh, people's purchasing. Nobody's gotten this to scale, although people have gotten it to low millions of people. Uh, just like the bookmarking space, like Delicious and Stumble Upon. It seems there's a small contingent of people, uh, or medium-sized contingent. Uh, it's not a scale service. It's not tens of millions of people. It's low single digits uh, who like to bookmark stuff, save stuff, comment on it, and share it. Uh, and so the question is for these companies, can they get to some level of scale? And I think, sadly, the answer is the world may not need this service as much as the people who really enjoy it enjoy it. You know, like, so the people who are in Delicious, they, could, they would tell people to the blue in the face, my God, you have to use Delicious, you have to do Delicious. And they said, why would I use Delicious? I hit bookmark in my toolbar and it works. They said, no, no, but it's online, you can tag it and share it. And, and they're like, I don't want to share it. And the, the, I, people used to talk to people to the blue in the face, you, you have to use Delicious, you have to use StumbleBot, and people didn't. Uh, and I think it's the same sort of situation here. I think it's a space that's not DOA, but it's never going to become huge, Tyler. But the could be one of those things like video where people have been trying it for a long time and a good amount of the pitches that we used to get and still occasionally get are very social shopping in nature 
and it intrinsically see, makes sense that you know people like shopping with their friends how can we do this in a digital way but I think if it does work out it'll be because some other technology takes off that allows this now to work in the same way that flash allowed YouTube to do what it does successfully in the um, some other breakthrough now that social networks work some other business business models work that didn't before social networks, right? Uh, so um, there there yeah. could be some technology or something that comes to fruition that would allow social shopping to then function. Um, it feels like there's a piece, a key piece missing for that yeah. puzzle done. I mean, here's so. an example. I pull up my screen for a second. Here's this next, and you see Mary Alice Cheney, Haney, and Harpix, and you know, you, you, I I found I would just dis for discovery. Um, you know, I'm shopping for something, but I don't know what I want to buy. So I want to buy something, and I want to buy something artistic, or I want to buy something sexy, or I want to buy something fun, or I got a birthday present for Tyler or for Jason. I have a birthday coming up. <laughs> uh, no pressure. But I want something stylish. Or I, you know, I know this guy's a business guy, but he also likes cars. You know, though, for that discovery, it's great. But I look at 95% of my purchases, 98% of my purchases, they're directed. I have a problem I want to solve with a thing, you know, or... Steve Jobs made that, I want that. You know, it, it's not like I just want to discover something, but for people who are social and do window shopping, these services are great, people love them. So um, I'm gonna bet it's gonna become a niche opportunity. I'm gonna bet that people are not gonna break it out. Tyler, you think uh, it could be? They just pulled up the lame book. Uh, it's, if you wanna see that joke anyway, it's not. <laughs> okay, Anyway, let's go on to the next story. Uh, NYA-based Hashable raised $4 million in funding yesterday. Mm -hmm. In addition to the $11 million raised since the company's inception when it was still Track.com or a competitor to Yahoo Finance, after realizing Track was never going to be big as he hoped for it, founder and CEO changed course and launched the company to focus on making introductions and connecting with people in general. So checked out that site, found you on there, Jason. Is Hashable the next LinkedIn? Why do you like it so much? I love it. Uh, I've been talking to the founder. I didn't invest, but I may be involved in some way mm -hmm. uh, because I just find it really awesome. Essentially, here you see I um, introduced Paris Hilton to Lindsay Lohan because they both have actual accounts. Um, and I did a bunch of other intros on there. Basically, what you do is you say, one person's, you know, I had breakfast with at Steep Decline, Tyler. Um, and what are you? you Kathy Choi or Cat you? Quips. Cat Quips. That's right. C A T or K A T? K A T. And Quips. <laughs> okay, so I say, uh, you know, I just met at Cat Quips, pound hashable. Mm -hmm. Hashable picks up anything with pound hashable, puts it into its database, and says, oh, Jason, and you know, this person and that person, boom, they met. That's the keyword. Or had breakfast with, or introed. So it's sort of a free form, uh, instead of checking into places, uh, like GoWalla, Foursquare, et cetera, um, it's more around people and behaviors. So you're basically keeping a semantic database of your behaviors and things you've done with people by simply putting pound hashable at the end. And it could be used for a lot of things, like I just bought at Steep Decline a ticket to, you know, whatever, Paris, pound hashable. Now it's got Steep Decline and I bought for Paris, boom. Sort of like Path, if you guys have played with Path a little bit. It's sort of got, you know, what, what's the relationship between these objects, person, place, and thing. So I, I like it. I think it's got great potential, but it's one of those amorphous, the street finds its own use for technology. I don't know exactly how people will use it, but I know people are going to wind up using it, and I see a lot of activity already. It's a great pivot, um, so and I really like the entrepreneur. You can introduce two people you don't even know. Exactly, and then it makes an icebreaker page, and if they, and they go talk to each other, then it sort of consummates it. I was going to say, you know yeah. both Paris Hilton and, and Lindsay Lohan? I'd be very impressed. Uh, well, actually, Kim jong Yo and Mike Arrington. Um, <laughs> for fun. Next story. So Diaspora, the open source Facebook alternative, is distributing its first batch of private alpha invites to the service after raising $200,000 in just 39 days Yep. through microfunding site Kickstarter in June. The four NYC, NYU students who are the founders have been hard at work and are, are now ready to re reveal the first version of the product. Um, could open source really give Diaspora a competitive edge over Facebook or other, other social networking sites? Um. I don't think that this is analogous to MySQL versus my, uh, Microsoft SQL software or Oracle's database where you know, people are paying for one thing and then they're going to go to something else because it's free. Yep. You don't have money being exchanged for Facebook. Facebook is free and this is a free product that will not have as many features. So there's not that main reason for open source. And open source, the other main reason for it is that you can tinker with it so, you know, and, and expand it. So in the short term, open source stuff is generally lamer than the incumbents, but in the long term you have so many people tinkering that better things come out of it. So 
it, it's going to be lame at first, like any other you know, point one product. However, uh, if they can get developers to start building on it and creating interesting things, um, there could be killer applications that have yet to be thought of by people who would not have participated if there hadn't been a code base for them to contribute to. And so I have high hopes for it. I don't think it's a Facebook displacer, uh, but I do think that there'll be other social networks. And all it takes is for Yahoo or Google or AOL or MySpace to adopt this. Uh, and when that happens, uh, and sort of a more open social network where you own your graph and you can export everything, and I can have a server for you know, all my friends with all their information on it, right. and it can be syndicated to yours and you know, this sort of BitTorrent model. It, I think it could become something with applications that we haven't seen yet, whether that's intranets for businesses or private groups, you know, or a university wants to have their own Facebook and they don't want to use Yammer because they want to customize it a whole bunch. Those kind of applications, I think it's going to do really well. It won't displace the global address book and photo sharing site and video game site that is Facebook uh, because I don't think that it's going to compete on that level, address book games and photos, which is 80% of why people use Facebook. Mm -hmm. Tyler, you have thoughts? Yeah, um, I think and what it, episode were they on? They were just on an episode. It, It'd be five episodes ago. Yeah. Maybe in the 80s, high 80s. It relates, though, to Path in a way in that if, if there is one thing that would threaten Facebook, I think it is going to be something that is more... Um, contained? Yeah, contained in terms of functionality. Private. Well, because the mistake, if any, that people themselves made when using MySpace was you know, getting all crazy with their design, and they were yeah, given right. freedom to do that. Right, they got enough rope to hang themselves. Exactly, and then Facebook kind of reined them in and, you know, artistically put them in a box so they can't do that to their pages or more control. And that was a huge benefit, right? So you have a more standard, useful experience. I think the mistake of any that people did with Facebook, I don't know to what degree, but I think people over-friended. And I think yeah. Dave Morin knows this intimately well, which is why Path is designed the way that it is. It's capped at 50. Right. So he's basically zigging where they zag. Well, um, no, but, but with very intricate and, and, and detailed knowledge about yes. what would... Path, I think Path is an absolute sleeper. Yeah. I think it's a sleeper. Right. I don't know that the photo is the and right... When I say sleeper, I mean it's a sleeping yeah. giant. Right, I think right, it's right. going to do very well because I, there, there are f less than 50 people that I want to have everything on. You right. know, And I could see people like you know what, I have this Twitter account and I have this Facebook account, but this photo is really for the 50 people I know will not uh, abuse the fact that I've shared it with them. So, hey, I got a picture of London with my wife. I want to share it with some people, but I, I would never, I, there's no photos of my wife online on purpose. And I actually stopped doing pictures of the baby because I just thought, man, what if, if there's some chance of some maniac out there gets I, upset at me. I could be wrong, I but I think... I don't want anybody obsessing or anything. I mean, besides Dave having intimate knowledge of... Having worked, at what, having worked at Facebook on the social side of things. Uh, and I, he must be familiar with um, Mixi in Japan, and Facebook must be very familiar with Mixi in Japan, which has a very limited, I think it's 27 people on average, share uh, network size. Right. And Facebook has a hard time getting adoption in yeah. Japan because it's so tight. And Mixi knows that's their, what's so special about Mixi. Those are real but friends. It feels like that's a natural evolution. You, you join a social network, right? And, and your first experience on MySpace was just you know, collecting your friends or friends, or collecting your friends, designing it a little bit, playing with it. Facebook was you know, sort of at scale, adding everybody, mm -hmm. games, everything, bells and whistles. Mm -hmm. And then at a certain point, you're just like, wow, this experience, and I have a sort of email I've been working on like 100 days off Facebook. This experience is not so appealing to me to have everybody in my business. Mm -hmm. And it's too hard to, you know, separate out people. I would like to start again. And if I could do my Facebook page over again, I'd like to do it with these 10 people. Somebody's service will do that and provide that value. Probably it's very astute insight, Tyler. Insight from Tyler. Story. Last story, last, last story. Last story. So in the spirit of the holidays, I thought I'd mention a study done by Retrievo, the consumer electronics blog that found more kids this solid holiday season are interested in iOS devices than traditional consoles. 31% of 6 to 12 year olds want an iPad, while 29% want an iPod Touch. Meanwhile, only 12% want a 360 and 21% want a PS3. The last thing people are interested in is 3D TVs. Interesting. So Jason, what's your favorite gadget of the season? Tyler? Um, I'm going to say I am in love with my MacBook Air right now, uh, to a very high degree. Um, the battery lasts forever, instant on is a game changer, and it's beautiful. As you can see, Tyler has the 15-inch, which I basically bought that, and then uh, I used it for two or three weeks and got the 
13 inches and 11 this or 13? 13, you That's got the 11. 13, yeah. and then I bought, I bought both. The 11 came a couple weeks later. I started using the 11. I said, you know what, I kind of like the small one fits in my man purse, my man bag. <laughs> My purse, my satchel. There's a, there's a trend going on in Mahalo with man purses. Oh, it's a man. Wait, it's, it's, it's one man purse, one upsmanship. But anyway, that was like he hasn't even seen this was gonna yet. this is this was gonna rip apart my my man purse. And I have like very high quality leather ones, and I didn't want to stretch them out. The 11 inch fits perfectly. So then wait I, till you see my man bag. He's, he's been you, you, with dare him to the you. Yeah. How dare you? Um, He's a throwdown. We'll have yeah. a man bag throwdown in the yeah. next episode. On Friday, we're going to bring in oh, both I'll our man. I will show you. Let's do that for Friday show. Okay. We'll just do a man bag <laughs> oh, showdown. Bring, you bring yours. I'll bring oh, mine. God, mine I'm, I brought it. Oh, it's broad. It's broad. <laughs> Consider it broad. But anyway, so then being the great guy that I am, I gave Tyler my 13-inch, and he loves it. And I have the 11-inch. I have to say, it's, it's that thing. One of the things with the statistic, though, I will say, uh, people already have their Xboxes, and they have their PlayStation, so of course they don't want a second one. And I don't think the iPad's a younger product than those other two, so... That could be skewing it a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think you have to ask them, which would you, if you could only have one device, which would it be? Right. That's the way I would phrase the question, not which one mm -hmm. do you want most, because people already have their Xbox and PlayStation, people are using them like crazy, and it's a renaissance of games going on over there with Call of Duty Black Ops. However, Mahalo Video Games channel on YouTube is crushing it, youtube.com slash Mahalo Video Games, and um, the Angry Birds and Cut the Rope and all those other you know, games on, those things are getting thousands of views. Tens of thousands. They're keeping up with the console games, yeah. and they beat probably two thirds of the console games. So the lower, I would say, the top third of console games are bigger uh, in terms of popularity. But in terms of number of people, I mean, there's millions of people who have downloaded Angry Birds. This is a serious, serious property. Um, it's not quite Call of Duty yet, which had a three hundred million dollar opening weekend or something like that. I don't remember. It was it was nine figure opening weekend. Uh, so these platform games are becoming billion dollar franchises uh, easily. Um, but it makes sense to me. The, mm -hmm. the, the products are getting incredibly refined. The screen on the iPhone now, the battery life on the iPad. I mean, it, they're, the, I, the iOS devices and the number of apps available to them and, and the value. I mean, you buy one game like Call of Duty, 60 bucks or 70 bucks. You could buy, I don't know how many games, probably 50 games on your iPad. Most of them are a buck or two or three bucks. And so in terms of value, probably the iPhone, better value. You have communication, you got email, you got browsing, you chat, you got Facebook, you got Twitter. There's no doubt to me that young people, if you gave them a choice, PSP or that, you would do it. Which means you'll, you'll see a bunch of social devices. So the next round of Wii's and Playstations and Xboxes. The Connect. All that stuff. Kinetic. All that stuff is going to be very, very social. They're going to make it so we can have a dance party with 10 people around, 10 different computers with a Kinetic. What do they call it? Kinetic? Connect? Connect. connect. It's Connect, the thing where you dance in front of it. Mm -hmm. I see these nerds in the back dancing mm -hmm. in front of it. It's super embarrassing. What do you think, Tal? I'm, I put out a tweet about this a while back after going to a Microsoft developer event, but I think the Xbox being Microsoft's like big successful thing they've done, you know what I mean, in terms of taking over a new industry, yeah. Nintendo had it locked and Sony was kicking it and then they came Sony in, was locked actually at the right, time. Right, yeah, but they managed to go into something that was really locked and up crush and, it. and crush it. Brilliant which product. they need to do in phones right now. Right. So I, I'm waiting. They need for, to do it in a couple of places. Search, right, true, phones, right? But I mean, I think apps. I, they've proven they can do it in a hardware way. They can do it. I think they need to do the X phone, in like the Xbox. Yes, just brand extension. Just, Why the, didn't they do that? I Tyler? don't know. So that is a second incredible insight. Why did they not just make it the X? The X phone, phone. like the I, just the yeah. X phone. Yes, right. and they could just brand all their consumer electronics X. You have X mouse, X laptop, X this. Yeah, no, I want the X pad. <laughs> right. I want the X Mac. Yeah. <laughs> X. Yeah. I want an X Mac. That would be such a cool device. Just replacing the I with X here. Yeah. I would buy an X Mac just to say I have an X Mac, and I like Mac. You like the letter X. I I think Windows as a brand has seen its glory it, days. It has a. Let's be honest. Windows has a lot of baggage. Right. So why and not? And the kids playing the Xbox don't you're even saying, speak of Windows. You're saying why not flip the script? Yes. The kids Topsy -topsy. like Xbox. They, they don't like e the X. They so don't call even the next. Yes. Call the next operating sec. Uh, the next operating system, Xdos. No, just call it X. <laughs> just yeah, just X. Yeah, change the name of the company from. We like Microsoft X. Yes. And make that their XOS. Yes. XOS. Yes. Well, how do you pronounce that? Zox. Zos. <laughs> Be like Zeus. I see. Then they would be talking about. And then, and I was also saying they need to put oh, a sixteen-year-old as CEO. This. Uh, uh, well. Interestingly enough, the hundredth episode's coming up, and you were going to make a big announcement. Is it that you're replacing Steve Ballmer? Can you give us a yes or no? I can't comment. Can't comment. Huh. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, you did an amazing job this week. Uh, second time doing the news, and this time, 
uh, prepared the news, not just winging it. Marked difference. I like it. Uh, you did great. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Tyler for a two insight show. Thank you to Doco and thank you to SendGrid for helping us make Twist a reality. We could not do it without them. Uh, bottom line, this stuff is expensive. Uh, if you have questions and want to jump the Shark Tank, that's funny, uh, email <laughs> us at, you know, it's like everybody's a comedian here. Uh, you just email us at AskJason at This Weekend. The giant 100th episode is coming December 10th. I think for the 100th episode, I'm just going to have 10 people call in, one more famous than the next. It would just be like a 100th like, episode, five 10 minute discussions. We just get like 10 amazing people to call in and wish me a happy 100th and just give them a little high five. Uh, thank you to TriCaster for helping us out. You still need to get us. Hey, Phil, I need that HD TriCaster. I'm waiting. I've been waiting for months. I need that. Everybody tweet right now. Hey, at <laughs> New Tech. Guilt, guilt, guilt. We want to see this weekend HD. Thank you to our friends at Storm On Demand, stormondemand.com, for hosting uh, gazillions of files and downloading them super fast. I mentioned SendGrid. Thank you to Seth from Scavenger. Everybody check that out. And we'll see you next time on This Week in Startups. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you.